You know what? I can take a hint. Spoilers for a movie that is nearly as old as I am. My name is Jill Bearup and my favourite way to spend my non-lockdown free time is hitting my friends with swords or staffs or my fists in a choreographed fashion, otherwise known as stage combat. And that is the lens through which we look at stuff here on this channel, so if you're interested in that, you know which button to hit. You won't get far in the world of stage combat without someone referencing the Princess Bride, and particularly this the flashiest and most complex of its fights. Here's the first thing you need to know. Audiences in general do not really want a realistic sword fight. Realistic sword fights tend to be fast, subtle, and indeed over quite quickly. If you want to tell a story with your fight, and we assume that you do, then you need some time for that arc to develop. There is a realistically long, shall we say, sword fight in the Honor Harrington novel Flag in Exile, and it's two moves long. Now, our protagonist Honor is special for a number of reasons which are not really relevant here, but the point is, if you were in a novel, then you can have three, four, five paragraphs of build-up and the climactic sword duel can take two moves and that's kind of okay. Especially if you're in the military sci-fi genre where you can have climactic space battles as your big set pieces. In a visual medium, you might need to stretch it out a little bit. Now, if you're in a group fight, then it's fine if you dispatch multiple opponents very quickly, but your audience would likely be quite disappointed if you build up and build up to this climactic battle and then, oop, done. In a visual medium, there are lots of things that you might want to do with your fight. Tell the story, teach us about the characters, show off what your actors or stunt performers can do, show off your cinematography or location or editing style, and of course, entertain us while you're doing it. And The Princess Bride is a great example of this. The film itself is a fantasy adventure comedy. I mean, that's what Wikipedia says and I have no reason to object to this designation. The tone, and this will be important, is fond and playful and combines an archness which suggests that they're in on the joke, because it's a parody, with a sincerity that stops it from feeling forced and cynical. In general, the more epic you wish a fight to be, the more careful you have to be about tone. I unapologetically love the throne room fight in The Last Jedi, but I do acknowledge that, on a technical level, it is, shall we say, perhaps overambitious. Which doesn't matter to me very much because I love what they're going for and I love the character moment that it represents, but is very, very difficult for other people and they don't like it at all. The Princess Bride has no such issues. Everybody knows that it is family entertainment. If the swords are a bit wobbly or the set is a bit 80s, well, it was a parody from the 80s, so we're going to be a bit more forgiving. The circumstances which have led us to this fight are as follows, or for the traditionalists among you, the plot to this point goeth thusly. Our heroine Buttercup has been kidnapped, because reasons, by a mercenary gang composed of the Sicilian, the purported brains of the outfit, and a genuinely nasty piece of work. Inconceivable! Fezzik, the rhyme-loving giant, and Inigo Montoya, a somewhat sober Spanish swordsman. Try saying that five times fast. They take Buttercup away on a boat, but are pursued by a mysterious man in black, later revealed to be Wesley, and climb the cliffs of insanity to get away. The Sicilian leaves Inigo to fight the man in black while he and Fezzik escape with Buttercup. And now we need to talk about build-up. Inigo is a great sword I'm going to do him left-handed. Hence the left-handed comment. He's in no hurry to catch up with his colleagues and he likes a challenge. So he waits. I hate waiting. Impatiently for the man in black to climb the cliffs. And they have a very honest exchange in which Wesley, we'll just call him Wesley, we all know it's Wesley, I told you there would be spoilers, says that maybe Inigo could throw him a rope. Inigo says, yeah, I guess I could, but you probably wouldn't take it because I'm waiting to kill you. That does put a damper on our relationship. Indeed. I love the dialogue in this movie. But then... I swear on the soul of my father, Domingo Montoya, you will reach the top alive. Throw me the rope. This should be a fight between a pirate and a mercenary. It should be brutal and utilitarian and ugly. Inigo should have dropped him the rope and, if he were foolish enough to take it, cut him down, or at the very least, dragged him up to the top and then immediately run him through. But Inigo is not that kind of character. This is not that kind of film, and this is definitely not the tone they wish to strike. Because there are baddies in the world of the Princess Bride, and you should never turn your back on them, but there is also true love and respect and trust, and sportsmanship, and quality dialogue. And just to underscore this, while waiting for the fight to begin, Inigo hands Wesley his sword to look at while he monologues about his backstory. I've never seen its equal. Character. You were expecting a scrappy fight between two bad men while well, you're getting an honourable duel between gentlemen. And that is signalled by these exchanges before the fight starts, by the tone and style of the fight and the dialogue they're in, we're getting there I promise, and even by the swords themselves. Because the swords are just kind of wrong for a fight between a pirate and a mercenary. Look at that long thin blade and that sparkly sparkly hilt. By film convention you would expect the dread pirate Wesley to be carrying a cutlass or something similar. Maybe something like Jack Sparrow's hanger. Instead, both he and Inigo carry swords which look more like 
rapiers. The swords they're using I don't think are actual rapiers, like say this one, because this weighs 1.1 kilos and trust me the blade does not wobble quite so enthusiastically as theirs do. I know that both of these guys are significantly stronger than I am, but no, I'm thinking those swords are probably lighter than this one. But this is a fantasy movie made in the 80s before Hema and historical reconstruction of swordplay techniques was really taking off, so are you gonna nitpick it? I am not gonna nitpick it. This video is gonna be long enough already. Suffice it to say, Inigo and Wesley fight a duel with swords which look gentlemanly. And we use this as another visual clue that they are, in fact, honourable men. We also know, if we're paying attention, that Inigo starts with his left hand on purpose, and so we're set up already to think that nothing is quite as it seems. Note that Inigo carries his sword on his left hip because he is right-handed, but Wesley, while he's carrying his sword behind him for the climb, has it back and to the right, suggesting that he's left-handed. A plus attention to your fake out details there. And then after this climb, this monologue, this underlining of the swords being used, they fight. On this channel we spend a possibly unreasonable amount of time asking, what is the takeaway from this fight? What is it supposed to tell us about the world, the characters, the plot, the tone that the film wishes to strike? And the answer seems to be that the tone they're going for is sheer joie de vie. We go from humour to sincerity to sportsmanship to soul-bearing to sheer joy. Joy and flinning. Because The Princess Bride is a parody adventure movie and it genuinely, genuinely loves the movies which it is parodying and that is part of why we love it so much. And frankly, no swashbuckling adventure would be complete without a sword fight. Or two. On this channel we call the sections into which fights are divided for learning and sometimes shooting purposes phrases. Because they're like dialogue or conversation or music, whatever you like. This fight is somewhere in the region of 230 moves long. We will not be going into detail with all of the phrases because we would be here all day. For context, the number of moves you would expect in a beginner level fight for an exam board like the APC or ACT is 20 moves. The largest number of moves you would expect in an exam at the honours or specialisation level is 50-something. 230, give or take. If you're interested in a literal blow-by-blow -blow account of the fight, there is a blog called Not Gonna Hit You and she breaks it down move by move and it's really, really detailed. It's wonderful. The choreographers for this fight were Peter Diamond and Bob Anderson and how to describe them. Hmm. Peter Diamond taught Errol Flynn and Burt Lancaster how to sword fight for screen and you may also have seen his work in uh, the original Star Wars trilogy or in Raiders of the Lost Ark or maybe Highlander, among many, many others. As for former Olympic fencer Bob Anderson, like Peter Diamond, he's basically the John Williams of fight choreography. You probably wouldn't know him by sight, but if you've seen an iconic film with sword fighting in Hollywood in the last 50 years, you've probably seen his work either in front of the camera as a stunt performer, he was Darth Vader in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, or behind the camera as the stunt coordinator. Bob Anderson, for example, did not do all of the choreography for Curse of the Black Pearl, but they did bring him in to polish up the fights and uh, give everyone that extra edge. No pun intended. The thing about being a fight choreographer is that you've got to work with what you've got. I mean that sounds obvious, but you are limited by both the whims of your director and also by the skill of your stunt performers and your actors, and the amount of time that you have to film and where you're supposed to be filming, and the vision in the director's head. It turned out that these two were both quite skilled and really into practicing. In fact they got so good that uh, they got onto the set and they performed their sword fights and they looked at the director Rob Reiner and he said, is that it? And so back to the drawing board they all went to create, learn and shoot a 230 move fight that included, among other things, left-handed fighting, stunt doubles but only for the flippy parts, as much of the set as they could cram in, and as much flash and excitement as possible. Remember that I said that the Curse of the Black Pearl sword fight might be my favourite movie sword fight, but if not it was definitely in the top five? Okay, this is one of the things that keeps it off the top spot. The others you'll just have to wait for. I think the setup has gone on long enough. Let us break it down into sections because as I said the phrases are too numerous and we'd be here all day. But we do need to talk about the arc. Again. The fight begins with tests. It's quick but it's also casual. Look at Wesley's guard. He's not concerned. Both of them are so unconcerned in fact that they're fighting with their off hands but in at least one case we don't know that yet. Attack attack slash but neither of them move significantly. Circle attack attack diagonal slash and Inigo smiles. 
Inigo is in it for the thrill of swordsmanship, and it's probably been a while since he fought anyone as skilled as Wesley. I would call this two phrases, but they come together to make one section which shows us that they're testing each other. Rather like the beginning of that Curse of the Black Pearl fight, actually. The second section is about on level ground, which is mostly textbook, advance, retreat, attack, parry, riposte. When we cut in close again, just in case we're getting too linear and fencing-esque for the audience, we add in a head slash and a spin. Linear attacks are all very well, and it's not the biggest set in the world, but Let's add some flavour. You might, again, note a similar approach in the Curse of the Black Pearl fight. And yes, spinning in a real fight is generally contraindicated, however spins look cool and dramatic, and so of course we're gonna have some. Especially in a scene which is basically, we're duelling, but we're having a great time doing it. Swashbuckling. And all that. Buckle that swash. Or, to be more accurate, swash that buckler. And as I said in the Curse of the Black Pearl video, you can provide interest and distinctiveness and an arc in the fight by dialing the complexity up or down. And so far we've been on level ground with no talking like it's a fencing match. So the third section is about on rocky ground and there is dialogue. You're using Bonetti's defense against me, huh? And I love the dialogue. And then there's a dramatic flip for a little extra excitement. The first two sections have Inigo and Wesley testing each other on a technical level. This section is a little more practical and psychological. Can you talk and fight? And how do you do outside of the fencing cell when the ground is uneven and rocky? After the flip, the dialogue continues with professional compliments. You are wonderful! And Inigo's pushed ever closer to the cliffs. Ooh, tense. What's going to happen? Were you paying attention earlier? Time for your first fake out. I am not left-handed. If you weren't really paying very close attention to what Inigo said right before the fight, this is going to be more surprising for you, but either way, it's still fun. Inigo's hand swap has renewed his energy and confidence, and Wesley is in trouble. To underscore the seriousness, there's no dialogue whilst Wesley is forced to fight up the stairs, retreating to seek an environmental advantage. But lest you get too worried in this U-rated movie, or G-rated movie for the Americans in the audience, Wesley speaks again. You're amazing. We're still concerned, but, you know, tone again. We're holding that tension at a children's movie appropriate level. Is it over now? I'm not left-handed either. Dramatic cheesy trumpets! Wesley's confidence is back and the fight is evenly matched again. No dialogue for a bit and then Wesley disarms an ego. But lest you worry we get too serious, dramatic flipping performed by Jeff Davis. Such drama llamas, the pair of you. I love it. Who are you? And there's that perfectly balanced tone again, keeping you suspended between excitement and comedy. This is, as I said about a million years ago, a duel between honourable men. Inigo isn't angry or even dismayed at this point, he's just in awe. I must know. Get used to disappointment. Okay. And did I mention how much I love the dialogue? I feel like I should mention again how much I love the dialogue. The last part is my favourite because it's the most ridiculous. We go traipsing all over the set, there are dramatic poses, sword catches, flourishes that are incredibly silly but you just don't care. And yet underlying all of the look at me ma, I'm sword fighting is the arc of the fight nearing its conclusion. We've tested each other out, we've swapped hands so that both men are now fighting at full capacity. While Inigo is the one who initiates this last exchange, it's quickly apparent that Wesley is the one in control, and Inigo becomes more and more desperate as he's forced to retreat until he's doing things which don't even really make any sense, but do signal that he's getting near to the end of what he can do. I mean, there's that wonderful bit where they both change hands and I love it, but look at Wesley's calm while Inigo flails. Wesley knows he's going to win. And then he cuts off a lock of Inigo's hair. A callback, but a relatively gentle one, to how the six-fingered man gave an eleven-year-old boy two facial scars. Both of them have been confident from the start that they'd win this fight. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. But it seems that Wesley's is the confidence which is not misplaced. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. And again, 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 there is that tone. I would soon destroy a stained glass window as an artist like yourself. Because Wesley appreciates a sportsman. However, since he can't have an ego following him, you know the rest. The Princess Bride does many things well, but I think its greatest achievement is that tone. The fight isn't a movie suitable for children, so it can't be too scary, but it needs to entertain, so there needs to be flash. There has to be substance to keep us engaged, but they let it run for as long as they can because we're just having such a good time. The fight shines such a light on Wesley's character that Inigo instinctively knows that he will help later on in the film. Wesley tells him nothing, not about Buttercup, not about who he is or why he's there or any of that, but it doesn't matter. Because of this shared experience of trying to kill each other, Inigo instinctively trusts him and has that trust rewarded. The fight builds from test to fencing match to unexpected hand swapping to unexpected hand swapping again to flash 
to desperation, to climax, without once taking its eye off that tone that we need. And it varies its tone between drama and comedy without ever straying too far in one direction. It's iconic for a reason. It's super duper long, but it's constantly changing things up to keep it fresh. And yet it never changes things so quickly that it becomes bewildering. And the length of time we can spend watching uncut swordplay really helps with that. I haven't really talked about the editing, but it's very nearly perfect. Long sections of uninterrupted swordplay, enough cuts that it doesn't feel stagnant, but not so many that we're confused. Could you even imagine this fight with the shortcuts popular in modern films? Could you imagine the nightmare of a 230 move fight with over a hundred shots in it? It just wouldn't work. It just it just would not work. In terms of choreography, we mix it up as well. We have short phrases, but we also have phrases which are extremely long. We have linear fencing, and then we have uneven ground. We have spins, we have flips, we have dialogue, left hand versus left hand, left hand versus right hand, right hand versus right hand, Increased confidence for Inigo, increased confidence for Wesley. It's silly, but it's not too silly. It's dramatic, but it's not too dramatic. It's funny, but not in a forced way. It's sincere, but it's not sappy. Tone is everything in parody, and The Princess Bride is a masterclass in how to get there. And see, now I'm getting sappy. Okay, this is the point in the video where if you're a $3 patron or above, I'm going to tell you about the projects that I have planned for release in November. Yes, I'm I'm being very organized. If not, and you'd prefer to watch some more videos on this channel, well then, all I can say is... As you wish. Exactly. See you next time.